Hey, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, we wanted to, so the public, the sprint demos is actually a release demo, uh, surprise. Um, so if you have been subscribed to our GitHub repository, you probably would have noticed already that we have the 0.10.0 .0 was released uh, two days ago now, so on Monday, um, which includes a lot of uh, new features. Um, we won't have time to go through every single feature, so I would really always encourage reading the release notes um, where we've tried to put into categories that are you know, kind of interesting. But if you want all of the very fine granular details like each PR that we've merged, you can kind of see here that uh, we've been busy. Um, so please read this. It's a lot of um, useful information. So for the stuff that we won't cover, uh, in this demo, then it can be useful as a um, reference point. So what we wanted to cover today um, in like the main feature highlights, the most interesting parts, um, we have demoed some of this previously in the last uh, sprint demo, um, but we're going to be kind of showing it again and maybe providing a few more uh, details about the stuff. Um, so the main highlights we have is like the firmware support for child devices. Um, we have the service monitoring, which is a great feature, um, the remote access plugin to allow um, accessing devices securely, for example, for SSH that goes to the platform and stuff. Um, uh, really sorry to interrupt, uh, but yep. you want to start recording? I have already started. Or, yeah, I believe it started. Yeah, I, I have the message that you did. So. Yeah. Um, so then we made um, a few more things configurable. So making it easier to basically store the data that you want to store in, in specific locations or partitions. Um, then the official APT repository that we're now using to host our Debian packages. Uh, and also a bit of prep work that we've been introducing to better improve the containerization story. It's more preparation, so we don't have any kind of big showcase. Hey, this is a you know um, ready to go Docker image that's in the pipeline, but it's more just the kind of preparation for those steps or, or before we can make those steps. And some honorable mentions, which is also very uh, key, um, very interesting for a few people, is that we have AWS support um, now, so that we did demo last time. The video is available online, and something that we haven't demoed, but um, due to the short time constraints of this meeting, um, we won't be able to demo, but we have Azure child device support now. Um, so that was a very welcome contribution by one of our partners um, that did a PR. So that was a very positive sign that we have um, partners also doing PRs and bringing features in, which is um, really at the end what we want to achieve. So getting started, um, we want to look at the firmware operation support for child devices. So I'll hand over to Rina to do the demo. Yes, thanks, Ruben. Then I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, let me do it. This one. Okay. Like this. Yeah, it looks good. Yep. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, Three is already two weeks ago, I guess. No, one, one month ago. I did a demo for this one, but uh, today is I'm going to do it again. So for the family management support for child device for Cumulosity. And so just briefly today, what I'm going to explain is uh, mainly two parts. So one is how to get started. It's uh, almost a recap of user guide. And the second part is kind of technical deep dive. So useful information I would like to provide for developers and also users who wants to debug. Uh, yeah, the first part. So how to get started? Uh, uh, so how to use the new uh, Formula plugin feature? So of course we have user guide, uh, but uh, yeah, I can show you a bit more details and with demo. So of course, first you need to have CNS version 0.10 uh, on your parent device. 
so precisely, actually, this feature requires three components, Tetch, Tetch Asian, and Seattle Farmer plugin, which is new for 0.10. And the second step is, yeah, for everything same, so connect to community. And the third part, um, declare, you need to declare a CHY firmware, a supported operation for your child device. So how to make this is also uh, captured in the user guide I'm going to show you later and also in the demo. And then start CHY firmware plugin service. Then next, um, run some child device connector program on your child device. So as of now, maybe it's some strange word, uh, but I'm going to explain also later. So just to keep it in your mind, uh, we need to have some special program on your child device. That's it. And then create from your operation on Cumulosity. So yeah, for this, I'm going to sh show you the demo now. Okay, so where is it here? Okay, and um, yeah, uh, so about the user guide, actually we have one for farm management plugin. So after my uh, demo and if we want to try out and uh, this is always a good reference for you. Uh, okay, so what I said is the okay, first step is install CH version 0.10 on your device. And now I'm using my Raspberry Pi. So just to confirm that I have uh, 0.10. Yep. So as you see, I have from a plugin 0.10, H8 in 0.10, that's 0.10. Yes, I have now 0.10 on my Raspberry Pi and connect to Cumulosity. I think this device is already connected to Cumulosity, but just to make sure, I use this reconnect to see it why. Yes, now I reconnect it, and the third part is uh, declare CHO firmware as supported operation for your child device. So today it's for demo purpose. So my child device is also uh, this Raspberry Pi. Uh, so, but now I want to create a new child device for Cumulosity. So, so it's actually my parent, this is my thing's uh, device. So parent device, it is named RPI to 150. It's connected to Cumulosity here. I already have one child device, but for demo, I'm going to create a new child device. So what to do? Uh, go etc, tech, operations, CLI. Yes, uh, oops. Create a new child device. Oops, sorry. Then, so when you want to have child device, so you need to have the directory under etc test operation CHY. And also now I want to have, I want to uh, have CHY firmware uh, supported operation for the new child device, the child demo 0 0.10. So I'm going to create also child demo 0 0.10 and then Oh, wait. Okay, then now, uh, I demo 0 0.10 as set by firmware. Yeah. Okay, then let's see my camera state. Uh, yeah, then now you see I created the child device on camera and this child device has firmware as supported operation. Yes, then now start step is done. And then start the CTR Farmer plugin service. Yeah, just simply restart. Then make sure that it's running. Yes, it's running. And the fifth step uh, is 
So run child device connector program on your child device. So it is just um, some uh, executable, I would say, and I will explain this one later, but as of now, just run this Python. Yeah. Then finally, I can create a farming operation on Cumulosity. And let's see. Oh, okay. So I have some list of Framia already in Cumulosity. I'm going to install this simple text 1.0 and install. Yep. And now it's successful. So the my magic text does something and it sends also successful to Cumulosity. So yeah, this is the part of how to get started. Uh, but now still like, we have some yeah mystery. What is this program? What I'm doing this is a child device connector. Actually, this one a user needs to prepare. So yeah, so I'm going to switch back to my presentation slides and so I'm going to explain for that. Yep. Again. The current side. Okay. So, uh, to understand uh, what we need to prepare for this child device connector program, so we need to understand uh, what is the contracts between Cumulosity, since the uh, device, and the child device. And the network connection uh, setup, so we are expecting Cumulosity and this device. Uh, communicatable uh, via internet, but since device and the child device, uh, they are in the same local network, so that means child device cannot access the community directory. So when you create a farming uh, operation in Cumulosity, uh, the first step, Cumulosity uh, publishes uh, set of farming operation by MQTT, and then since the device uh, is going to receive it. Then uh, this one is actually smart rest. Uh, the CH device knows enough information uh, where uh, it needs to download the file. So the second step, since device downloads a file from Cumulosity, and this is HTTP. And afterwards, so, so for this device, it's now ready to create a request to, to child device. So since the device uh, publishes MQTT message uh, to inform child device that now you are, uh, we have new from an update request and the payload uh, is actually JSON. Uh, then, Child device now knows how to uh, download the file. So you get uh, inside MQTT payload URL. So this is a local URL, like HTTP uh, 192, something IP address 80. Yeah. Then, child device uh, downloads the file from CH device via HTTP, and then to do some firmware installation. The next, after finishing firmware installation, uh, child device uh, needs to inform sense device that I finished success. I finished this uh, firmware update successfully. So this one needs to be done via MQTT. Uh, then, after receiving that uh, response from child device, since device uh, forward. Uh, that operation status to Cumulosity. So it is very simplified diagram. So some variant, actually you can also sense fail, uh, fail uh, here and also executing message like before you really start from your installation. In that case, also CH device uh, 
is going to forward the executing message to Cumulus state. Then the Cumulus state status will be changed to executing. Then afterwards, successor of fate. Yes. Um, so actually, this child device connector's responsibility is to write or to have the program doing the bottom part. So receiving uh, MQTT message and also the get uh, download file and do some from installation. The afterwards, uh, promises back uh, the response via MQTT. So then now I, it's demo, so I'm going to show you what I wrote in the Python. Yeah. Okay. Then here. Here. Yes. So we can confirm that um, I wrote as I explained now. So the here the core part. So here actually is having some MQTT connection to local host. Uh, then uh, it subscribes a message. Uh, it subscribes a topic. This touch childly uh, commands like farming update. And once this program received the request from Thin's device, and then it sends executing message. Then afterwards, download a file from Tech file server. It's accessible. Uh, then afterwards, uh, verify the file with the checksum. So this is highly recommended. So actually, in the payload, uh, you get. Uh, SHA-256 of the Fermion file. So you can use this one to check some. So what you get in the request and what you download is the same file. Yep. So some check. Uh, then here you need to have actual logic for install Fermion, but uh, because it's demo, I just wrote the sleep. And then after finishing, and then sends successful message to this test child ID commands response list from your update. Yes, so this simple program is uh, reflecting um, what uh, we need to do, the, the child device connector needs to do in the here bottom diagram. Okay, so then now, so this uh, getting started part is done. So next slide, uh, current slide. Sorry. Oh. Okay, and then um, with the technical deep dive, uh, which is not, uh, I think, mentioned in the user guide clearly. So uh, Actually, Seattle from your plugin has request timeout uh, to child device response. Uh, this is now configurable by Tech Config. Uh, set from your child update timeout, and you can set the seconds. Uh, but I think some case uh, downloading file takes so much time, or installation of firmware. Uh, Take so much time. In that case, if you publish executing status uh, by MQTT, and that prolongs the timeout. Yeah, that's the utility. Uh, then uh, this Fermia plugin use uh, Vartech directory quite a lot. And uh, so this Vartech directory itself uh, is one subject that we are going to show later. I mean, uh, Alvin's going to present this is actually configurable. But um, so Fermion plugin uh, uses a three subdirectory. Uh, one is a keeping file cache, so vartage cache, and also keeping the data of active requests vartage firmware, and exposing simulating of the file cache to this HTT transfer service. Uh, Vartage file transfer subdirectory. And these subdirectories are uh, created by set by farmer prang it dashes init command. 
So I'm going to show you. So now we are inside of Vatits, and I said I mentioned the three subjects: so cash, file transfer, and formula. So cash is the real file that uh, since the device uh, download uh, from Cumulosity. And for file transfer, so uh, if you have multiple child device and you are going to have also child, uh, the directory for each child device, and then this is a good example. Sometimes, so you you want to use the same uh, file for multiple child devices, but of course we don't want to download uh, many times per each request. So that's why uh, we use the simulink here, for example. So these two should be the same file. The original file is only uh, we have one uh, location and the cache. Uh, but uh, both uh, child devices directories uh, have simulink to uh, this file. So that means it's both uh, accessible by um, the URL that you received from uh, 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 FSTS device. Yep. And the last part, so firmware. So now I don't have any. Uh, active operation, but I can just quickly uh, make the operation now. OK, replace firmware. So now I have an active operation, and you can see this one. I hope I'm fast enough. Yes, and um, this directory keeps some information. What is operation ID, child ID? And, and so on. Yeah. And this one, after operation is done, it's going to be removed. Uh, let me check the status here. Ah, so now I'm my child connector is not connected. That's why. So this operation was not consumed. So I think it's okay. Um, OK. So when timeout happens, for example, or in any case, if uh, operation fails or successful, then this uh, firmware active operation information will be gone. So that's, I think, everything that I can show you today. Yep. OK. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, that this, is a, this is everything. I'm going to uh, I show you today. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Rina. Um, so yeah, I think it was we wanted to go into a bit of like to demystify, you know, some of the actions which are happening under the hood, um, just to also um, make people understand that it was also uh, there's a lot more kind of small difficulties there that then Thin Edge takes away from the user going, OK, we can you know, do efficient saving of um, disk space by, you know, using the SIM links, so we're not duplicating data on the devices. And so this is all the heavy lifting taken by Thin Edge, so you don't need to do that implementation yourself. Okay, so thanks again, Rina. Uh, so moving on to the next part, we have the service monitoring that will be demoed by Pradeep. So over to you, Pradeep. Thanks, Ruben. Um, let me share my screen. Hope you guys can see my screen. Yep, we can. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Um, uh, in in 10.0, we re, uh, actually introduced a feature called service monitoring. I have did demo actually uh, in uh, uh, actual releases. Actually, not this is only release uh, demo. Actually, um, here I'll show how this service monitoring feature of Cumulosity can be used to monitor the services which are running on the thin edge device or the child devices which are connected to the thin edge device. Um, here, uh, I show like, you know, uh, 
three things actually like uh, how can you monitor um, as I mentioned a service which is running on a thin edge device from CI to Y and also how to monitor a service which is running on a child device from CI to Y and also like you know you can configure the default service type um, uh, of the services which are running on the thin edge device. Um, coming to the first one like you know um, Every uh, thin edge services that runs on the thin edge device um, will actually emit uh, its status actually like you know on this topic. Um, it's a health status which will contain um, status of the service and the type of um, the type of the service. So that will be picked up by the um, thin edge mapper uh, which is uh, for C8Y. Uh, it will translate the messages into um, a smart rest message, a service monitoring message. This is a health status message, and that will be translated to a service monitor message um, by the service um, by the uh, TED mapper um, and writes it onto the uh, S slash US. Um, here, one or two is a, um, a template number for the service monitoring messages that contains a service ID. The service ID is uh, ID unique ID for that particular service. Actually, uh, how we generate is we use um, device ID and um, prefix with the service name, um, uh, postfix with the service name, and the type. Uh, you can uh, give the type here uh, when you send the health status message. If the type is not mentioned as part of this message, then the default value will be taken uh, by the mapper. And it will add it here and the service name. Uh, we get the service name from this topic. And uh, the status, the status uh, which is sent through um, the health status message will be translated and it will be sent to the cumulosity. In the same way, actually, we can uh, do the same thing for the uh, child devices which are connected to the uh, thin edge device. Here, um, the health status message will be written onto this topic. Um, edge health child device ID and the service name. The state uh, health state message will remain the same as the parent device. Um, then the mapper will pick it up and it will write onto this topic. Uh, it will translate the um, health status message to service monitor message. Uh, the service ID will be like you know uh, prefixed with device ID and the child ID and the service name. Uh, and the remaining things are like uh, same as the parent device. And um, actually, by default, uh, if the service is not um, sent by the service uh, which is getting monitored, then uh, we will use the default value as service. Sorry. Um, if uh, someone wants to configure the default uh, service type, then they can do it using the uh, thin edged uh, CLI framework, uh, like you know, command line interface. Uh, like this, uh, set the service type. For example, I'm using system D here. You can give any string actually. Uh, if you want to have a, a comma separated things, you can just give it within the quotes so that it will be um, taken and put it into the, uh, I mean, uh, displayed on the cumulosity side. If you want to have the default value, you can just do unset, then it will go back to or fall back to this value, the service. Uh, let me do the demo. Um, yeah, uh, now actually uh, I already connected um, to uh, Cumulosity. So you can see here um, when you connect the, um, when, when the thin, when a Tinet device is enabled with the service monitoring feature, then you can see uh, this um, uh, entry here in the UI side uh, for services. Actually, if, or if you click on this one, it will show all the services which are running on that system or like, you know, Health status of the um, status of the services which are running on that device. Uh, the green shows up, uh, the, the red shows down. For example, if I uh, I'll stop the agent actually. Now you can see um, the agent has gone down. So the status. Uh, is updated here on the UI side. Um, yeah, and the 
the type actually here. Uh, I have set my type to uh, yeah um, some different string actually default type because none of these services are providing the service type with their health status message. So I have set it uh, as um, this string. So the mapper picks it up and puts that as the default type actually. Um, you can see here. Um, yep, this is the service type I have set. That's why it's sh showing like this actually. Um, if I want to do unset, um, then it will be uh, unset, but the effect takes only after the restart of the mapper. Um, I did restart the mapper now, um, so you can see it updated the service type on the next run. Um, yeah, uh, that's it for the child device, um, parent device. Um, let me go back to the child device. You can do the same thing. Oh. Uh, for the uh, pair, uh, uh, child device as well. Um, if if the monitoring is enabled for the child device, I already created actually. Um, you can see here. I ha I want to monitor the Docker service which is running on that particular child device. So. You can see here um, that is getting monitored here and the status is up. Uh, if I want to monitor something else, I just uh, simulating here. I don't have exactly the same uh, child device connected to it actually. Um, now I will create another child device. I want to monitor the Docker service which is running on that child device. Um, what happens here is like it will uh, create a child device. Um, we go back. Child device. Uh, there's one more child device created, and we can see the services which are running on that. You can see here the Docker is running here. Uh, it shows the service uh, which is running on that second uh, child device. Yeah, we can do the same thing, like you know, if we can send status as down, it will go down actually, uh, and the status will be updated here as down. Yeah. Um. Yeah, you can set um, even other uh, strings as the status, for example, unknown. Then uh, it will update that as well here. With the different, yeah, uh, this one. Yeah, uh, this is all I had Any questions here. Uh, so the, the system at uh, the type of source that you said. That yep. is mm -hmm. on the global level for thin edge. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's on the thin edge device. It's at the global level, um, which will be picked up by the mapper the, because the mapper is the one which translates this health messages to the um, service monitoring messages. If it is not finding any kind of a, um, service type in the health status message, then this will be put it as a default message, default type. Yeah, exactly. It's only used in the, a fallback if the user doesn't specify what they want on the message. OK, got it. Because it needs to be there because um, it's part of the interface for Comlosny. Thanks. OK, in the essence of time, um, We'll move on. Thanks, Pradeep. Share. OK, next one, remote access. Um, so I want to go into a bit more detail about the problem or that we now have a nice solution for um, regarding the new remote access plugin. Uh, so this is a Comelocity specific feature. Um, however, I don't. I think it probably could be supported by other clouds, but it's more of a cloud implementation because it's not a standalone feature. It requires then, you know, a, a corresponding bit in the cloud to run. But the main use case for the remote access is so if you have your IoT device there on the right side, and maybe you want to have access. Or give specific power users SSH access into the device. Now, you so because these IoT devices are generally connected to the internet, 
or could be connected to the internet, um, you know, to access the cloud platform. Generally, you will never enable an incoming port so anyone connect to it. So basically, this setup just doesn't work because the firewall blocks it here because it says we don't allow incoming um, connections on port 22, which is the SSH port, um, access denied. So how do you do this securely? So this is where the remote access plugin comes in. So because we have an already or like a always on connection, so from the IoT device, you have Vintage installed on it and it's communicating to the IoT platform of your choice. That is an always running connection. So that's actually a connection which is established from the device outwards. So allowing outgoing ports is let, um, is a lot more uh, standard practice rather than incoming uh, because of less kind of security risks there. So what the setup is, um, so with the using the MQC connection, that we actually use the cloud remote access feature from Comelocity, and that basically acts as a tunnel, kind of a proxy, like a um, which then connects these two ends from the left side from the user to the right side to the SSH server. So for example, if we want a SSH connection, in the end, the SSH client needs to be able to reach the SSH server. So to facilitate this, there's a lot of moving parts there. Um, so Comlossi plays the, the fundamental role of like passing the traffic through. Um, on the client side, there's a uh, open source component called the Comlossi local proxy. Um, that establishes an operation to Comlossity that says, hey, uh, I would like to connect via this proxy to the device. The operation gets sent to ThinEdge, so via the MQT connection, which already exists and is established from the device. They get translated and go, ah, OK, you want a tunnel? I know who can handle that stuff. Passes it to the remote access plugin. That creates a TCP server um, to basically proxy the WebSocket to then the local TCP server, uh, which is the SSH. And then once that's established, it basically just passes bytes back and forth. Um, so this enables you to securely connect to your device, um, which is very, very powerful because that is normally not allowed, um, especially when these devices could be anywhere in the world. Um, so how does that look? Because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline, so it looks more complicated than it is. So what that means um, on how it looks for the user is is actually super simple. That I can do SH. If I just type this wrong one, that's uh, very my three. I'm in. I've even used the native SSH command, and this has established all this magic for me. So it means that the user doesn't actually really need to know that they need anything else to run. Um, under the hood, if you look at my SSH config, and if I get on the right device, you can configure that saying when connecting to this host, so this is the you know external identity of the device, so which is running ThinEdge, you say to establish this, we actually need a proxy. So this proxy configuration is then this local proxy, so the C8YLP action which does the cum Comelocity communication, says, hey, I would like to establish a tunnel. Can you please set it up for me? That uses my Comelocity credentials that I have set up already in my environment. Um, and then once it's ready, uh, it then passes the connection to the SSH. So that's super, super useful. And it's not just limited to normal SSH commands. So uh, for example, here I was just doing, you know, uh, interactive session and doing something, uh, but we can actually use is also like secure copy. So if I wanted to copy a local file to a device securely, not only through SCP securely, but um, coming from the device, I've now just copied a file to the device. Easy. And then I can connect to the device again if I do, and that's the file I transfer. 
So it works really, really nice with whatever kind of uh, setups um, that you have, and it's not limited just to SSH. So SSH is just a really convenient example um, and what we use a lot and also in our setups, um, but you can also do any kind of TCP traffic that you can then route it through then uh, this plugin, because in the end it's a pass through function, so it doesn't try to um, dictate what kind of communication protocols you use. As long as it's a TCP based, then you should be fine. So I think we've had other customers use it also for the uh, PLC program that they want to then connect to the device via that to provide access to the development uh, on the device um, and to do like, you know, debug sessions and stuff like that, or you can do a VNC um, server and whatever. So it's really up to your imagination. So that's a nice addition uh, to our product, which will help with the debugging um, and making basically the devices more accessible, even though they are IoT devices. So the package is also included by default now in when you install ThinEdge, that will be included. So you won't really notice much out of the box. Um, there is a bit of to configure. So for example, um, on so this is the device I was connecting to. In the remote access tab, so you need special rights. Um, so I'd, um, refer to the Commonwealth documentation to make sure your user has the specific rights. And then it uses this pass through kind of function where you can add endpoints, pass through, et cetera, and saying, I want to then pass it to the local loopback address uh, on port 22, which is where the SSH daemon is running. And the same can be used also for the classic kind of web SSH. Um, so if I click in here, um, using the same port, then I can also, using the UI, then establish a, a nice SSH connection. Um, but the web SSH is just because the underlying technology that uses is a little bit slower, so it feels a little bit clunkier. Um, so for people, especially power users, they're probably not so impressed with the web SSH. Um, if you can provide them a native SSH experience, then people will definitely jump at that. Uh, but this can be convenient just for accessing for on the on the fly kind of connections um, because you don't need to install anything on your machine. So it can be convenient for kind of shorter sessions. OK, um, then moving on with. To the next topic, um, so I'll hand over to Albin to show how we've improved our configuration possibilities of controlling where do we store data. Yeah, thank you, Ruben. So let me quickly share my screen. OK, so yeah, we can see it. OK, yeah. So uh, with this release, we have actually introduced a new configurable parameter called the data path, which will let you config, uh, which will let you configure where ThinEdge and its components, like say the former plugin configuration plugin and even ThinEdge agent stores large binary files. OK, and uh, so all the other, so we already had configurability for temp path, logs path, run path, et cetera. So this is the new addition to that set. And the default location is slash var tech. So uh, if you saw Prina's uh, presentations, you would have noticed that uh, the cache files and uh, the firmware files are actually stored in this location by default. Okay, so now we support uh, changing this uh, this particular path uh, because some customers uh, they would have limited storage space on their root partition where uh, probably even the var slash var uh, directory is uh, mounted on. So they would want to keep these large files, especially firmware files. They could be pretty uh, pretty big and there could be several of those especially with child device support uh, so you would want to store it on probably a different file system uh, which with higher uh, higher size so what you can do in such cases is uh, have a higher sized partition mounted uh, on a different mount point and then configure this data path to point to that particular mount point okay so that's the uh, typical use case so quickly to see a demo. So right now uh, I haven't changed it, so I still have uh, my system is still configured. The data path on my system is configured to slash var text, and you'll see this, you can see this directory is cache, file transfer, firmware, etc. And uh, the cache directory is currently empty. So now if so, I'm going to perform a firmware management operation just to show where the files get stored, etc. So I'm going to push a file. 
and after some time. Yeah, it's complete. It's done. Uh, so now if you go back and check this location, uh, you will see that the file got downloaded to this path, the default location. So now how do you change it? So uh, as I said, it's a then it's configuration parameter. So what you can do is uh, you can just do search config set data path and you can just point to some other location that say it doesn't exist slash slash where album okay so you update it and after updating this path it doesn't take effect immediately so you need to reinitialize and restart all the components that uh that use this path okay which are say the tech agent the configuration plugin and firmware plugin so so let's do that quickly so what i need to do is I can, I'll stop the existing TED agent and reinitialize it so that it picks up the new data path. Yeah, all good. And then start it back up. Okay, and similarly, I'll repeat the same for uh, the firmware plugin as well, which we are using for the demo. Stop, sql dry, firmware plugin hyphen hyphen init. Recreate and start. So start. Okay. So now, as soon as you do this and all, all the reinitialization itself, you will be able to see that uh, the exact same directory structure is recreated at the new location. Okay. And now, just to see uh, the runtime impact as well, I'll and uh, yeah, just to validate that the cache is currently empty. Yeah, there is nothing there. And now if you push an update, uh, it's still being processed. Okay, done. And now if you come back and check, yeah, so the new file got downloaded at the new location. So this is how uh, you can update the data path uh, if, your deployment requires it to be changed from the default location. And the key thing is you you uh, for now you need to uh, stop and reinitialize and restart the service. Uh, but yeah, in a future release, we will be we, we are going to uh, make it more dynamic where you don't have to restart your service or anything to uh, to get this uh, change picked up. So yeah, that's all I had to show. Uh, any questions? Thanks, Alvin. Maybe, yeah. yeah, just to reiterate like the, the the design decision. So generally the setting is not something you play around with all the time. It's more if you build a, if you have like an image which everything's running, you're going, ah, you know what, the var petition for whatever reason is not persistent, I want to move it somewhere else. You can do that now. Um, so it's more kind of like maybe on the device setup part that you're going, this is the place that we're always going to store things because if you change it too often, then you know you don't get the benefits of having a cache because <laughs> you're kind of deleting everything and starting from scratch again. Um, so, but it, it allows you a little more control and you can configure it however you want now. So, in the essence of time again, uh, we can always um, you can put further questions on Discord or in the chat after, and we can um, answer them uh, afterwards. So some more less demo-ish uh, style, more kind of uh, hints to documentation. So we have the Debian packages now available on the APT repository that we have um, generously provided by CloudSmith uh, for free. Um, so all of the packages, we have different repositories um, that we have every time we merge to main that we publish then the built artifacts to the Tedge main. Um, and then when we have the official release that we go, OK, it's now doing the 0 0.10 release, um, we publish to the Tedge release where you can see just the officially timestamp. So you have the best of both worlds. If you want you know, the bleeding edge, you can check out new features that as soon as the PR gets merged, you can try it out. Um, or if you say, hey, I want to wait until, you know, all the features are done and I have a nice change log, um, then you can, you know, hook up to the Tedge release uh, repository. Instructions how to do it that are on the websites. Um, 
we will I, I need to move the documentation around so it's invisible on the actual public website. Um, so I'll do that uh, shortly. But I can post the link in there and where it details the kind of the de design decisions about you know what repositories for what purpose, um, especially with CPU architectures, um, with the highlight that for Raspberry Pi zeros, which use uh, ARM v6, uh, we now have a dedicated repository for that due to a Debian name clash, unfortunately, um, but we have zero control over that. Um, but previously we weren't making this artifact available, but now it is available. Um, and then again, details on the pre-releases and also the naming convention of the versions. So you can understand, you know, where this version number is generated and how it's generated automatically and what that actually means. So you can actually find, you know, what commit did that relate to? Okay, the last part is we just want to kind of highlight what new configuration possibilities um, that we now have available, which is the prep work for the containerization story. So one of the importance of containerization, there's usually the expectation that you can also control configuration elements of the components via environment variables. So we've added a very simple mapping that you can now change everything which is in the Tej Toml file via environment variables. So for instance, if, or you can check out the documentation that we have available um, where we, so for example, if you want to control the CAY URL, we add a common prefix, so tedge underscore, and you just have to take that string and uppercase it and replace any dots with underscores because dots aren't accepted as valid characters in um, environment variables. And that's actually quite standard in a lot of tooling that you'll see out there in the wild, that this is a you know, very straightforward um, translation. So you can even automate it if you want. Um, so that allows you then to easily in, so for example, if you build a Docker file and let's say that you wanted to run the Tej agent as a single process uh, Docker file, um, you can kind of control it here and bake even in the environment variables within the Docker file or if you're using like a Docker Compose, you can put that in the Docker Compose file. So you don't need to then, you know, copy a Tej config file over there, which can be a hassle, especially if you are playing or like using a cloud image, which will come in the future. Um, so that makes that kind of storyline a lot more convenient um, for you. But just a heads up. Um, so if you are running a multi-process container where maybe um, you're running system D within the container itself. So the entry point will be system D. This will not work because by default, system D does not inherit environment variables from PID one. Um, just ignore that if you don't know what that means, um, but just a heads up, if you are doing that, you know, that won't work exactly. Um, but the, the goal that we're going to is having a single process container or multiple containers where it's really running it like this, where a Tej agent will be a container, um, the Tej mapper will be container and stuff like that. And there'll be shared state in between those containers by using volumes. So I think this is an important step, quite simple, that maybe not everyone makes use of it now, um, but I dare say in the near future, that will definitely become very, very useful. For the other non-mentioned features, um, again, please check out the documentation if you want to check how to connect to AWS um, and check out the release notes if you want more details and feel free to post any questions in our Discord um, or raise uh, tickets in GitHub if you need some help or assistance. Um, for those who I know we're over time by 10 minutes, um, are there any open questions for those who want to stay? Uh, just maybe a quick one for the firmware update. Uh, so I understand that this is a CAY firmware operation, but would you consider that it's also usable for any software updates for child? Uh, so the important mechanism there is technically, yes, you could use it for anything. However, the main mechanism that is kind of, I wouldn't say limiting factor, but the, the way firmware is modeled in Comolosity 
is that you can only have one firmware. So okay. you're replacing firmware. You're not really upgrading it per se, even though it could be technically an upgrade, but you can't have multiple different firmware operations running because the interface which is provided is saying, ah, what is the current firmware? You can't have two. So it depends okay. on how you want to model things. Okay, thanks. But if you don't want to do that, um, like if you can say on my device, I can have two firmware running at the same time, then that's usually an indication that you should be modeling it after software and not firmware. But like anything like firmware, what you decide to model under firmware is up to you. Like if you say firmware version one, that could be an operating system, that could be a collection of packages, that could be anything you choose what you represent this artifact as. Hey, any other questions? Okay, no, then um, thanks for listening and uh, thanks for the extra 12 minutes. Uh, and I hope everyone has a nice day. Oh. Ah, that was a clap for Ocean. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Yes, thanks everyone. Good job.